Um, so we can start our final session for today. That will be the MEG uh, software presentation, and we'll have uh, two wonderful softwares to present today, the m &E Python, Brainstorm, and Find uh, Neuro. And its presentation is supposed to be around uh, 10 minutes, followed by quick uh, Q&A if there is any. Um, so we'll begin with uh, m &E Python. Uh, the presentation will be given uh, kindly by Dr. Mainak Zas. Mainak is an instructor at the Martino Center at Massachusetts General Hospital. He completed his PhD in image and signal processing from uh, in Telecom uh, Paris Tech in Paris. Uh, and he has been uh, an MNE contributor since 2013. We have the best. Uh, developing several key models, including auto-reject, MNE bids, and the MNE report. Um, so he knows the software really well. Uh, his current research uh, focus is leveraging the new optically pumped magnetometer sessions for neuroimage problems. And I do want to add a personal note that uh, Mainak is uh, extremely fun to work with, and I always admire his positive spirit. So we'll have some of that uh, today. <laughs> Mainak. Thank you, Dimitrios. Um, hello, everyone. So, you know, Dimitrios has positive spirit. Uh, normally, we do like three day workshops for MNE Python, and he said, Could you do this in 10 minutes? And I'm going to try. So, um, here, my goal is to just give you sort of a flavor and pointers so you can explore more on your um, own. So, um, just to, you know, give you a little bit of history and uh, the vision of m &E. um, So it was started by Mati Hamalainen um, back in 2001. Um, it was originally meant to be a pipeline for source estimation uh, using what's called minimum norm estimates, so m &E, minimum norm estimates. And it was written as an interactive graphical user interface uh, in C language. Um, in 2010, uh, Mati had a postdoc, Alex Gramfort, uh, who decided that, no, this is, GUIs are no good, let's convert this into Python. And his vision was that, well, Python being a free and easy to learn language could transform m and &E into a community-driven software where features are sort of inspired by uh, people in the community and based on user needs. So m and &E was designed to be scripted. Um, it's scalable, so if you want to do multi-subject analysis, it's easy and it's reproducible with certain interactive elements as well. And um, even though it's uh, scripted, um, that does not mean it is difficult to learn. Uh, it has a unified programming interface, uh, which I'll show you shortly, uh, and this means that there are repeated coding patterns, which makes it uh, really fun to work with. And finally, I want to mention that m and &E has been integrated with the um, scientific Python stack. It means that we don't rewrite functions, for example, to do temporal fil filtering, and we instead rely on you know, SciPy and other standard libraries to do these things. Um, so um, it's fair to say that today the package has sort of, you know, m and &E stands now for MEG and EEG, so it covers everything under the sun. Um, you know, all kinds of sort of pre-processing, uh, source estimation, data visualization, connectivity analysis, and statistics. And we have, you know, thanks to this vision, we have more than 350 contributors up to date. Um, so m and &E is a pretty big software, so the starting point uh, is the website, m and &E .tools, and um, it has extensive documentation. You have documentation how to install it, um, how to, uh, you know, there are examples, there are tutorials uh, with uh, example data sets that you can run. Um, and if you have already a Python environment available, then you can just do pip install m and &E and get started. Okay, so, um, so the basics of Python, so even uh, Python is an object-oriented language. Uh, what this means is that even though you don't have graphical um, elements like buttons and menus, there is still a logical organization to the code which makes it uh, easy to work with. So um, the main data structures are inspired by standard workflows of MEG and EEG processing. So the raw data structure is channels times time course, uh, which is basically what you load from the files. 
And uh, once you have that, you would have certain events in your data based on your experiment. And you extract sort of a time window around those events to create epochs. And then from those epochs, you average them together to get evoked responses. So this is like the standard ERP analysis workflow. And this would be source, uh, sensor space analysis. And then uh, people working with EEG often stop here. But in an MEG world, it's often common to go from these evoked responses uh, to source estimates. Uh, and this is what's known as source space analysis. And I'll just give you like a sort of brief flavor of what can be done uh, with sensor space and source space analysis. But there's a whole lot of things that you can do. I mean, David's talk, uh, David Popel's talk was basically an advertisement of what you can do with MNE Python. Uh, so, um, so yeah, sensor space analysis in less than a minute. Um, so first thing is we'll import the MNE module. Um, then I read the file that I need. Um, I add bad channels to the data. And then I can bad and pass filter it using some kind of methods. And then you can you know, save it back to disk, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, to create epochs, you need to identify the events of interest. So you do find events. And then you supply those to the mne.epochs object. And you create epochs from that. And finally, you average them to get uh, evoked responses. So pretty straightforward. I mean, you couldn't get any simpler than that. Um, now, in addition to manipulating data in command line, I mean, he also offers many <laughs> visualization routines. So for instance, uh, you can sort of look at, um, you can browse through the data. You can see that there are different channel types. Um, you can mark certain segments of the data, uh, annotate them in ways. You can say that they're bad segments. You can do different kinds of, uh, see what is the effect of pre-processing, et cetera. And um, so that's just uh, very simple. You just do raw dot plot. You can also look at power spectrum density, just do raw dot plot underscore PSD. And this can be useful to understand, for instance, how the data was filtered, if there are any frequency artifacts, or if there are any brain rhythms of interest in the data, right? Um, but um, you, you can do this not just with the raw data, but also with the epochs object. So you can just do epochs.plot, and this pops up a similar sort of interface as the raw uh, interface. And you can you know, manipulate the data in the same way as you can mark bad channels, bad epochs, et cetera. Um, epochs has something called epochs.info, which contains metadata. So MEG data has a lot of metadata where the channels are located, uh, sampling frequency, uh, et cetera, which you need in different stages of the processing pipeline. Um, and this. Uh, info is um, actually inherited from raw. So you have a raw.info, you have an epochs.info, you have an evoke.info. So I just want to sort of hammerhead this idea that you know, there is a really unified interface that's, uh, that has repeated patterns th throughout. Uh, so again, coming to evoked object, how would you plot the evoked data? Evoke.plot. So this gives you what's called uh, butterfly plots in MEG. Uh, EEG, so these are basically average time courses overlaid for uh, different sensors, which uh, the color is showing you the sensor location. Um, then, but if you want to look at a certain time point and see what the topography of the response looks at that time point, you just do evoke.plot underscore topo map. Uh, if you want to look at them together, you just do evoke dot underscore plot underscore joint. So it's, it's pretty straightforward. Um, so this is all in time domain, but in MEG, we are often interested in uh, frequency domain. We are interested in brain rhythms. So we can also uh, do frequency domain analysis. So the simple way to do it is, you know, you do raw.compute underscore PSD. So you compute the power uh, spectrum density, but you can do this also with, again, epochs and evoked. So very straightforward. And then you do plot topo map and you get the topography of uh, frequency of different frequency bands. So again, repeated patterns uh, makes it easy to use and learn. Um, now, if you want to look at time frequencies, or you want to see how the uh, frequencies are evolving over time, you can use wavelets, for instance, Morley. And you can, again, look at the plot across time. 
So at this point, you might be asking, OK, this is all good, but how do you know which method to use? You know, uh, do I have to learn everything to know what method to use? Uh, well, the API reference on the website is your best friend. Uh, the API reference basically has a list of all the functions that are available in m &E. And when you click on a certain function or a method, you will see the different parameters they're described, what arguments they take, what they return. All of this is described and available online. So um, you know, uh, use the website uh, as your friend. Um, getting back to sensor space analysis, we are often measuring in MEG tiny signals. And there's like artifacts due to environment. Um, you can apply pretty advanced tools. For instance, you can do uh, Maxwell filtering. And this has a dramatic effect on the data. Again, a one-liner on m and &E Python. And then uh, there are other alternative methods. I'm just showing you one method. Uh, go check it out on the website. Um, you can do independent component analysis, which is often used for uh, physiological uh, artifacts, like cardiac artifacts, eye blinks, et cetera. Uh, again, uh, two-liner ICA.fit. And then you can plot uh, the ICA components in time, uh, time domain and also in uh, spatial domain. So you can look at both the time cores. For instance, you can see the cardiac uh, artifact just pop out. And also uh, spatial maps, for instance, you, here you can see the eye blink artifact. And then uh, you can see what is the impact of excluding certain components. And you can exclude them and apply it to your data. Um, and then um, once you have cleaned the data, uh, you can go from sensor space analysis to source space analysis. So to project the data to source space, um, the first thing you need to do is make what's, called, make what's called an inverse operator. Um, and that uses a forward model that describes how the sources are transformed into MEG sensor space signal. So you take the forward model, you invert it, you get what's called an inverse operator. And then you can supply that to an m and &E function and tell what method you want to use. You say you want to use m and &E and it'll give you the source estimate. But you can just you know, change that method. You say DSPM or S Loretta, and you get uh, a different source estimate, which is basically based on different assumptions that some of these methods make. So no matter where you are and what stage of the pipeline you are at, uh, there are sort of repeated patterns. And you can also do things like dipole fits, mixed norm estimates, volume sources, subcortical structures, et cetera. I'm not going into all of that. but all of this exists, uh, use the website. Um, now, I wanted to show you very quickly something that's pretty unique to m and &E. It's called the m and &E report. Um, so this is designed for quality assessment at scale. So let's say you have 50 subjects in your study, and you have five processing steps per subject. Um, you don't want to manually check 250 steps if you did all of that correctly and if that gave you uh, good plots. Instead, what you can do is you can save an HTML report uh, for each subject that you can glance through afterwards, spot problematic steps, and also uh, share it with colleagues. And depending on your workflow, you could have a report per subject or per processing step. And using the m and &E report is, again, simple. Um, any plot in m and &E, it returns what's called a figure handle. And you can supply that figure handle to the m and &E report. And in the end, you can save it uh, to the HTML. Um, so finally, I wanted to mention that m &E has been built on top of libraries like NumPy, SciPy, Matplotlib. Um, but now m and &E is being used to develop other libraries, such as AutoReject, MMVT, PyRemen, uh, m and &E Connectivity, Brain Decode. So you have this whole ecosystem of neuroscience tools that are available to you uh, in Python through m and &E. And uh, we have a forum for answering questions. It's a very active forum. We have biweekly office hours. If you have questions that you can't uh, get answers through the forum, you can uh, come to the office hours. Um, so in summary, um, you know, we have data structures in m &E, which are uh, pretty straightforward to use. Uh, you start with the raw data. You do some pre-processing on it, construct a box. From there, do the averaging. 
and then from there you go to source estimates. And then for all of these data structures, you can do similar kinds of processing. For instance, you can do time frequency analysis, you can look at connectivity, statistics. Uh, you can do very fancy machine learning like time generalization analysis, time resolved decoding, all of this. Um, the key point is that there's a unified interface. Uh, go use the website and join the forum. Thank you. Thank you, Mainak. That was actually a fantastic presentation. I knew I couldn't go wrong. <laughs> um, if anybody has any question, um, while we can have uh, Sylvan setting up, uh, we do have one question over there. We do have automated pipelines for uh, you know, annotating uh, independent components. So there's core map. Um, there are also some tools to just for EOG and uh, like cardiac and eye blink artifacts. I don't know to what extent I see la uh, labels goes, but you know there is some automation definitely. Uh, and then you can use the ME report to sort of do quality assessment once you've done that automatically. Uh, one more question over there, and then we can uh, proceed with the next yeah, speaker. I have a question about generating the, the forward model. Um, so we use a Windows subsystem for Linux to run FreeSurfer. Uh -huh. um, and it doesn't automatically generate the PEM surface through uh, recon all. OK. So I was wondering how I'd be able to call the Windows subsystem through Python to generate the PEM surface within my pipeline. So. I mean, M&E relies on what FreeSurfer gives you, so uh, you do need the FreeSurfer surfaces. Um, I mean, I, I don't know if uh, FreeSurfer works on Windows or not, but yeah, it's it's a dependency. So if you can run it on Linux, that would be great. Uh, yeah, so I, I don't have an alternate solution for you. That's, that sounds a bit complicated technical question running the subsystem, so <laughs> <laughs> maybe these bi-weekly actually sessions are <laughs> ideal <laughs> to solve this. I didn't even know they existed, so that actually was an informative presentation. Mm -hmm. um, but the <clears throat> Brainstorm software he will present is indeed, uh, has indeed some impressive numbers, like 43-something uh, thousand registered users online, like uh, not obvi obviously not everybody that registers uses the software, but the, it shows the interest. And also 3,000 or so publications until now related to this. Um, maybe the numbers change, but uh, <laughs> Sylvan, please. Thank, you. Thank, Thank you. you. All right, I thought you were gonna say 43,000 bugs, but no, 43,000 uh, <laughs> registered <laughs> users. Probably more than, than that. Yeah, so, not thank you, Maynac. It's a very tough act to follow. And the answer to your questions is just use Brainstorm. Okay. <laughs> I think I should stop here. But no, fantastic work from Maynac and the, the whole MNE uh, team. Um, and as you're going to see, we, we see it as a healthy, friendly competition and cooperation opportunity for interoperability, as we say in software. Um, but more on that later. So um, we started Brainstorm, I'm afraid to say, about two decades ago with the intention to share basically the methods we were developing in, in the lab uh, with, the, uh, with everyone and for the greater good. And at the time, I'm not sure the notion of open science, open source was really, really so developed, especially in, in neuroscience. So there was SPM around and FreeSurfer and a few others, EG Lab for sure, in our community. But we were very uh, you know, happy to be among the first ones to get our feet wet uh, with open source and sharing. So we started with the uh, question of about, OK, if we were users, what we would like to have access to? We would like basically to have access to good software um, so that we, have, we, we are able to use uh, our better scientific you know, uh, methods. So first, I guess we need to define what we mean by good. And I will go through each point, illustrating how Brainstorm, of course, uh, is aligned with each of these. So it has to feature relevant tools, though, those that are current, you know, well-established, but also very current and new, and maybe even some prototyping ideas 
that the neuroscience community wants to use. It has to be easy to learn for many reasons, because you, you are not, most of you, like me, you are not developers, you are not coders, you want to be efficient in what you are good at quickly. Um, so you want to be able to learn what's good and not so useful uh, about this package or another package, uh, because there are so many now, right? So uh, there, there, there's a lot of pressure to, to be productive with uh, the best possible tool for your questions. It has to be easy to learn, easy to use. Uh, there needs to be you know, support. Uh, it has to be foolproof because so many things can go wrong. In general, in science, in empirical science, in particular with electrophysiology and maybe uh, MEG because of the many, many different aspects surrounding uh, data collection, quality control, uh, analysis parameters, etc. So the software needs to be a tool that helps you do things properly. Uh, it has to be evolutive, always on the lookout of what's coming next and interoperable with other uh, toolkits. Uh, it's not, uh, you don't want to, to uh, uh, build your ivory tower and pretend you know, the rest of the world does not exist. Uh, it's really an ecosystem. Um, and you want to share basically the fruit of your efforts in developing a pipeline with your colleagues and maybe with your paper. And if it were free, that would be fantastic, right? So let's see that. Uh, first of all, like Dimitrios said, uh, Brainstorm is free. Uh, it has been supported by multiple uh, successive NIH uh, grants our, through the R01 mechanism. So we're very grateful for that the NIH actually you know, uh, has the uh, foresight to support science, especially in our field, through uh, this funding, I mean, through funding. It's not only for MEG and EEG, but also in recent years, we have developed toolkits for electro, multi-unit electrophysiology. So for those of you who do, for instance, animal models uh, and animal recordings, we have tools for you in there, and we interface with many toolkits that specialize in those things. Um, there is a, quite a few features for structural MRI and CT scans, especially if you do implantations in patients or in animals. There are tools to register the electrodes where they are located so that you, you know where you're looking in the brain. And through collaborators at Concordia University in Montreal, we have specific toolkit including in Brainstorm for FNIRS, so near infrared spectroscopy. Uh, so it's, uh, I'm gonna show you um, <clears throat> more about the software, of course, but like Dimitrios said, we've grown over the recent years, uh, over the past 10 years, a community of uh, thousands of people at least interested uh, in the software, and thousands have also published with the software. So we, to us, this is the best possible feedback and token of uh, impact. And also what we like to do is travel the world and meet our users, our future users, physically, in person, and deliver two, three-day workshops. And we've done that almost everywhere, on every continent, and I'm very much looking forward to our first workshop in Africa sometime uh, soon. So it's a bunch of good people, uh, some are in the room, so I'm looking at you, Beth, and Dimitrios, and probably others. Uh, so it's a community of folks uh, organized around the lab uh, of Richard Lee at USC in Los Angeles, and my lab in Montreal, John Motion at UT Houston. Um, so feature relevant tools. So I won't go into the details uh, at the level that Maynack mentioned, but basically, it's all of the above, uh, only in a different package, from you know, data collection, including the digitization of head points. For those of you who do that in the MEG, you should. Um, data review, artifact correction, et cetera, modeling, source modeling, um, signal extraction of different kinds, spectral analysis, cross-frequency coupling, and of course, statistical inference and machine learning, like classifiers, et cetera. So the whole, you know, toolkit that is, we hope, uh, quite relevant today in, uh, in uh, current neuroscience research. It's easy to learn because we feature hundreds of, um, oh, I'd like to start this, but of course my computer has frozen, which never happens, right? Ah! <laughs> <laughs> Might be an MNE, uh, MNE instance. So we, it's easy to learn because we provide tutorial data of many diff different scenarios, MEG, 
basic neuroscience, MEG, clinical neuroscience, EEG, uh, animal recordings, etc. And every recording, every situation is actually documented through, uh, um, you know, uh, tutorial uh, web pages. And you see that we have a tutorial for every single situation you may face, from basic scenarios to more advanced one, as you can see, uh, focusing on the registration with, uh, with anatomy to spectral analysis and decoding, etc. cetera. Um, then the software is organized, uh, and that's a specificity of, uh, of Brainstorm, I think, through a database or a data file organization that you see on the left. So you know, oops, it has again, uh, yeah, there's something wrong going on here. So it doesn't want me to show you the good stuff. So I think we should, I should, uh, you know, stop here. But <laughs> why don't you try it? Just brainstorm, uh, <laughs> brainstorm MEG, uh, you just Google it, it's free. Uh, you can do good stuff with the graphical user interface, but you can also script everything. You can share your scripts with your good friends and colleagues or with your papers. Um, so it has both the best of both worlds. You, it's very user involved in the sense that you learn by doing and you build your pipeline graphically if you are a beginner. But you can also, once you are you know, more advanced, you can use Brainstorm as a library like MNE Python and build your own pipelines just you know, from the graphical user interface or directly using Brainstorm as a library, like I said. <clears throat> the cool thing also is that we interoperate with many Python. So from MATLAB, you can call Python routines. So if you want to use certain good features of many Python or field trip or EEG lab, well, like you said, we don't reinvent the wheel. We just, you know, let you the opportunity and the freedom to use those tools without, uh, you know, moving back and forth between software environments. Um, what else? Um, I think that's about it. So, yeah. Um, yes, what we, I could suggest is that if you'd like us to come and visit you at your, um, at your institution, uh, that happened with Sergio when uh, he was still uh, uh, in Chile a few years ago. We visited him and his uh, supervisor, and we delivered a, a course there over three days. It was a lot of fun. And um, Sergio is here. He's a postdoc now at the Martinos at the MGH. Uh, so what I mean to say is that with the support of our grant, we can travel and suggest that we visit you and um, deliver a training course over one, two, three days, depending on your needs, around specific topics you would like to, you know, um, uh, go deeper into. And it could be um, for a group of uh, as little as 12 to 15 people to actually the the world record of a brainstorm workshop was 10 days, 10 days ago, 10 years ago at the MIT here, where we got about 100 people in the same room. And it worked, I think. So I should stop here and come to see me for a live demo on my laptop later. And uh, thank you. OK, so the third uh, software presented today is Fine Neuro. Uh, it will be presented by no, I said it's not my name. It's, uh, never mind. It was a joke. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> uh -huh. It will be presented by uh, Dr. Noam uh, Pellet. Um, Noam is a co-founder and CEO of Fine Neuro and instructor at Harvard Medical School. His research focuses mainly on epilepsy, um, precision medicine. He's interested in using neuroimaging and physiology. Uh, multimodal data sets to study epileptic patients, and more broadly, he's also interested in analyzing and visualizing multimodal neuroimaging data sets. Uh, and his platform, Fine Neuro, is a way to maximize the impact of his uh, work. No. Thank you. Thanks. Hi. Um, so, Fine Neuro is a company that Stephen and I founded, I think it was six years ago originally. It was based on my postdoc with Steven since 2015. Um, and I want to just say that to celebrate that uh, we are also particularly partner with McGinn. Thank you, Beth. Thank you. And it was a spin out from uh, the Martino Center. 
Uh, the idea about Find Neuro is to take the tool that we developed, you and my postdoc, and to make it more, clinic more clinical tools for epilepsy surgery. So it's a clinical support platform. But under the hood, it's still there is research algorithms and pipelines that we also want to, that they will be used in the research community. Um, so originally, we developed a tool that called MMBT. It's very uh, great name. I hope it will stick. We have a great logo, as you can see, from Metallica, if you recognize it. And the idea about MMBT was that we collect rich information, if it's MEG, EG, um, fMRI, sometimes invasive electrodes, uh, like we did during my postdoc. And we want to explore the data. We want to visualize the data after some kind of a pipeline analysis. And it's hard. It's, it's really, really hard. Even MEG, which is four-dimensional, it, it's hard to explore. So if you want to, on top of that, use other data, it, it's really hard. So that was the idea behind developing MMPT, to explore the data, understand the data better from a data-driven approach. Nowadays, we, did, we are working a bit more than that. Um, so what we are aiming to do, and I'll take it step by step, and by the way, you can go to findneuro.io to play with it. It's free. Uh, we're doing a couple of steps. So right now, we're doing it at MGH and other hospitals, but we also want to do it at different labs or facilities to help organize and curate the database. So if this is a clinical database for epilepsy patients, where you can see what data was collected for each patient, and you can also upload data, you can run analysis and so on, and also eventually visualize it, we also do, want to do the same thing with labs. Because at least what I found out, that it, it's hell. It, it's really hard to understand where the data here in NARO is, is really helpful with that, because with Steven, it's 18 years of data. And if I want to do now a study on more than 10 patients, it's, it's really hard. Where are the data? Because most of our database, like um, REDCAP and those kind of database, it can tell me about medical information, but where the data is located and how I can use it, who knows? Now, I think in Greek. <laughs> <laughs> so this is our first task. To create this database, you can search, you can see exactly what was collected, and you can do group analysis, and you can create reports, and you can share, and you can do whatever you want to do, and visualize, of course. We also implement by ourselves different steps of pre-processing. So luckily, I used to be, or still actually, a Cubimate uh, with Minac. Where is Minac? So it's heavily based on MNE Python. Thank you, Minac. And I'm, I'm not using the website. I'm just looking ahead for a, a Minac and asking questions all the time. <laughs> so I yeah, used to do that also. And so for each image, it's heavily based on MNE Python, but we also have other modalities. So we're also heavily using FreeSurfer for reconstructing the anatomy. If it's functional fMRI, we use an FSFAST. If it's invasive electrode, we use other tools. But the idea is that it doesn't necessarily need to be those tools. If we're using Brainstorm or any other tool, hopefully, you can also do that because we, we don't, it's not like we don't care. You, you can use your own analysis, and in the end, we have a very easy API, a very easy approach to import everything to our to MMBT. So MMBT looks this is the new MVT. We took it from, if you know Blender, it used to be a standalone tool. It was horrible to install. And, and eventually, we are taking everything to the cloud or to the web. So you don't have to install anything. If you have a server in your center, you can also install it locally. And I think I created a short video. So the idea is that this is a 3D reconstruction brain of a patient. This is a template brain. Oh, thank you. I like to see what you. Oh, okay, yeah. No, that's okay. Can you hear me? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. It's more like for the online thing. Okay. Yeah, I can shout. <laughs> um, so here it's uh, fMRI, and switching, but the idea that you can visualize and explore the data, and eventually also look on data that change over time in a multimodal way. And it also can produce very nice pictures. So these are uh, three covers from different uh, journals 
of three different papers that use MMPT to create these pictures. And here are just a few examples of what you can do. So, for example, this is uh, in blue, you can see the um, registration of post op city of epileptic patient with prop MRI. And we, you can see, do a 3D slice to see where the SIG electrodes, the orthotic EEG electrodes, are located and also how they change over time. Um, here we wanted to compare the strongest hub, let's say, of EEG and MEG. Actually, that was MEG and fMRI, so you can see different colors, and we call it the dead zebra view. So you can see the whole connectivity and compare it between the different modalities. But I really like this example because we just took fMRI and, and power of, uh, I think it was gamma power of MEG, and wanted to see if they are correlated. So usually people are using high gamma power, let's say, and compare it to fMRI, but it's really hard to, uh, to select the band, right, to select the frequencies. So here inter interactively you can see the power, I hope you can see the power, uh, of the frequencies, and you can see that there are different peaks. So maybe if I choose this peak, the results will be completely different, who knows? So in MBT you can do that. And this is the TMS and EEG. And also a nice movie, The Animals Trying to Things. This, that was our first movie for DARPA, because they like shiny movies. Um, so this is the same brain. Uh, resting state of MRI, this is the raw data, and the connectivity at the same time, how it changes over time, and also the correlation, powerful correlation over time. Yeah, so you can do very nice videos and pictures like that. Um, but I think what is more important here, that's what we want to offer now that we found the company, to the rest of the community that you can use our tools as uh, someone from MNE Python, one uh, course who told me that, ah, so you, you are the glue. So I think that's kind of capture nicely what we are trying to do. We are trying to glue different labs together. We are trying to glue different modalities together. So we also would like to uh, offer hosting even if someone interested. So if you have a lab that's doing something else, something one, something, and you want to collaborate with a different lab in a different state even, and you want even to share your pipelines, and not only the results. So it will be much easier uh, to do something like that using our infrastructure. So that's all. Um, I also have a short study, but it depends how much time do you have. And if you want, I can... Yeah, yeah, that's okay. So I'll talk very briefly about something that we did using our technology. Um, and that's uh, we wanted to see if in epilepsy, if we can look on ep of networks and we can find nodes in these networks that would be targets for surgical uh, treatment for epilepsy. And I'll go very quick on that. But the idea that it was really hard to visualize these results. Uh, for example, we, want, we created functional patches on the cortex and it's in a native space. So we cannot do any group analysis here. We need to go patient by patient. We want to see how different patches are changed over time. So we can visualize the time. And then eventually you want to see, for example, if you're doing grand causality, how does it look in the native space as a network? So this is a mess, but this is interactive and you can rotate it, you can filter the network, and you can see how it changes over, over time. And so for me, I think that I had this MVT tool that I always add features to do my own research. That was extremely helpful to understand the data and see if there is something wrong with it. So for example, here, what we also did was to register the post-op MRI and to see that the nose that we found that was driving the network was actually in the center of the resection zone of an epileptic patient that was seizure free after the resection. And you can, all, you can do that inside our platform because we have also the slicer view. So you can pinpoint any node in the network, see where it is on the slice. So all of these things are much easier that this is the result. So thanks so much, and that was uh, 20 minutes talk in two minutes. <laughs> um,
Um, but I think maybe the take home message that it doesn't really matter if you're using Brainstorm or SPM or Penny or MNE Python, you can use it together with our platform, hopefully to do better research and to create a community in an an easier way and to share data and ideas. Yes. Ah. So, depends if you're a clinician or not. If you're a researcher, <laughs> we're trying to do it for free. So we, we are trying now to build servers in different institutions, so everybody be, be able to use it. Um, clinician is a different story. Uh, research, we don't really have a business model around it. We just want to help to do better research. If you can put us on your grant, that would be great, but <laughs> But the other things would be free in research. If you want to do neurosurgery based on our tool, that's a different story. Just like, uh, the reason why I ask is sometimes there are medicines, like for example, where you know, you can Yeah, so again, so the clinicians won't be like that, but for research, um, we haven't built yet the research community, but this is up to the community, and that should be open for everyone. Um, one of the things that we're trying to make it simpler, that's now that nowadays that's every grant, I think, that you're writing, you need to explain how you're going to share the data. So using this tool, it will be much easier to de-identify the data if it's patient data and then click a button and upload it to Open Euro, for example, in bids format. So hopefully during the time, if researcher will use this platform, we'll, we'll have a bigger, and, uh, bigger data sets that everybody can use. And, but now for the, there is Open Euro, but if you look in Open Euro, you need to download the data and you need some tool to explore the data and it's really hard to visualize this data. Here you can just click and view the data. Yes. I'm not sure if this is completely related to what you're doing over here, um, but is it possible to actually get um, data on seizures localized on while they're happening using a vending machine, especially because the whole body is shaking? Um, yeah. You can focus some amount of stillness, which is do it with interictals. You can do it with interictals, then there's no motion. Um, I, I said that uh, if you if the, the patient is also interictal events, right? It's, it's that's the patient is not moving, then you can record and uh, one of our dreams that's for example to do MEG and to dynamically create the networks while they have seizures. Maybe if we are using OPM, sorry about that, uh, you can also use TMS and try to manipulate the network while the seizure is happening. But ICTAL events themselves, uh, that this is a question for Steve. If you think that during ICTAL events you can measure. Typically what you do is you measure up to the onset of the seizure and then you know, within a second or two you can start getting the changes. For patient safety reasons, you Sometimes there's a uh, type of seizure that you're not moving, and you know those you can actually record um, during the seizure and after. Um, but that's harder to do. Um, but there are sites like the Cleveland Clinic that routinely get ictal MEGs um, because they're taken off their medication and brought into the MEG specifically to get these seizure events. But you basically Thanks. So thank you all so much for attending. We had really an exciting series of lectures and presentations of the software. So I hope you, um, you found this uh, symposium exciting. You got any new interesting ideas for your research. The tools, the software tools are definitely available 
at our disposal at were much better now than what we used to be a few years back in terms of uh, software too. So thank you all, and I don't want to stand uh, on your way for the reception outside. Uh, so let's um, gather outside and talk first.